In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Dear seminarians, dear faithful, let's first admire today in this third Sunday after Easter the pedagogy of the church which follows very tightly the pedagogy of our Lord himself. It's the first time today that we hear about the ascension. Our Lord always prepared his disciples to the great event to come. Even if almost each time the apostles were taken by surprise, our Lord had done this work of, of preparation, of disposing the souls to the coming event. And so we see the church. We see the church precisely today. We are in these days after the resurrection. During the first Sundays, she insisted on the reality of the resurrection, which is the greatest proof of the divinity of the Godhead of our Lord. She insisted that he remained, he remained with the apostles. So we see some of his apparitions. And today, we still remaining in these famous 40 days after the resurrection, but we start to raise our eyes towards the next event, the ascension. At the same time, during that time, there is a reminder from the church and this reminder is, raise your eyes and your heart. This phrase which goes through the whole time of the, of the Easter time, the Easter season is, qui sum sunt sapite. Have, have the Savior, have this, this wonderful taste for the things of above. But above, that's heaven. Non quis super terram. Don't, don't stay on earth, where of course we have our feet very good, screwed on earth. But the church insists, no. Of course, we have a lot of solicitude. Everything, all our life here on earth is evolving on earth. But she insists, your heart, already now, must raise. Our Lord said it. He said, where your treasure is, there is your heart. Where is our heart? Is it down below? mixed in the earthly things, or is it up there? We, we touch there something, in fact, something very important, and <clears throat> very important for you future priests. Your, your mission as priest is to save souls. That means you must try to, to reach the heart and to move them out of sin into God. How are you going to do that? First, <clears throat> there is a major principle which we must emphasize and remember all the time. There is only one who can and who does 
produce, cause the sanctifying grace in the heart of the faithful. And it is God. We never, as human beings, will do that. Never. And we have this phrase from our Lord, without me, you can do nothing. It's simple, it's absolute. Nothing. And so, the first thing which is needed from you, requested by our Lord himself, is stay in me. Stay in me. Because without me, you can do nothing. Well, watch out. We could conclude, okay, so God does everything. I do nothing. No, that's not what our Lord said. He said it's the will of the Father that you bring forth much fruit. God wants us to work. When you, he said to the, <clears throat> the apostles, go, go to all nations. Even if it is himself who does give the grace to each one of the souls, he does it through the apostles, through the work of the apostles. Uh, a nice little story, a little reminder of this truth, which I, I find fantastic. It's um, a very, very famous preacher in, um, in France, the Dominican, Father Lacordaire. He was preaching in Notre Dame in Paris, very, very famous preacher. And when he gave one of his fantastic sermons, and after the ceremony, a lady came to him. Oh, Father, your sermon, it was so good, so it converted me. And the father, a little bit integrated and curious about this event, said, asked her, okay, good, could you tell me what thought brought you to, to the conversion? And she said, Father, it's when you said, let's go to point two. You can see there. Yeah, God is using our work, but not the way we think. He's not bound. He's not bound by our weaknesses. You can never use as an excuse, I have this or that imperfection. Never. Because God is greater than that. But of course, we have to make all our efforts. We must give the best, definitely. And so looking at this human psychology, what are you going to speak about? What will be the main topics in your homilies, in your sermons? Is it just do this, do that, don't do that, don't do this. Because the faithful will come to you and say, so it's like they did to the apostles. What should we do? On, on the day of Pentecost, you have these, these people, it's like the same, the same with St. John the Baptist. You have the people, they listen to the sermon and they say, now what should we do? And when you, you go into this answer, what should we do? Of course, you go into the morals. You go into the commandments of God. And I may say, it looks like the easy way. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's not the best way. Our human nature is made in such a way that whenever we move, whenever we do something, we do it for a purpose. So
So your first, your first work is to direct the intelligence, not the will, the intelligence to understand their purpose, to understand the reason why they have to move and in such or such a way. As clearly they have the knowledge of the purpose, of the aim, the better they will, the more convinced they will be. That's why the church insists, preach first the doctrine. Preach the faith. From the faith, there will be conclusion in our handling. So there will be moral consequences. But these moral consequences, they will touch the hearts as far as in these hearts they have gone to a conviction and the conviction comes from first the knowledge and the knowledge of the aim. When, when St. Paul says, quis sur sum sum sapite, look above, he raises. So why do we look above? Because there is God. God is our end. God is our end. You have this famous word of St. Augustine, quid quid agis. In whatever you do, respice finem. Look at the end. Look at God. In fact, there you touch so many things at the same time. We have to fight defects. We have to get out of these bad habits. We have to acquire virtues. We have to get these good habits which lead us to God. If we are convinced, I want to go to God. I want to be united with him. I want to love him. Well, this will be the greatest help to fight the defects, to fight our sins, and even to acquire the virtues. If there is no love for the end, no love for God, no love for our Lord, we will remain in our misery. That's why the first point, so important, talk to the faithful about God. You will have to, from time to time, talk about the misery of this earth. Yes, you will. Of course, we need to know who we are, what we are. You will have to mention the dangers of this world. It is true. But that does not help. What helps is the faith, is this look in God. Look, our dear Archbishop, he liked to use this example. Look how St. Thomas speaks about morals in the Summa. And our dear Archbishop liked to say, liked to mention Look how he organizes all this part, which is a very important part of the Summa, where you have the secunda and secunda secunde, so we have even two parts. He says, St. Thomas does not organize all this part which speaks about the morality on the commandments. Many of the modern moral books, they organize the moral, see what we should do, what we should not do, following the commandments. Well, they come from God. Okay. St. Thomas organizes the whole matter looking around virtues. 
not the commandments, not do this, do that, but the virtues. We could say this way, maybe it's a little bit of a language with modern language. He speaks positively, not negatively. And this touches again our human psychology. We have to, from time to time, necessarily, we have to speak of the bad things. So we have to demonstrate, point out the errors. But to understand an error, you must first show the truth. The error is always something which is opposed to a truth. If you stay on the error, you will never have the right grasp on what it is or how serious it is. This is true of any evil, any evil. An evil is always a gap, a hole. We call it privatio, deprivation of something good. You have to give first the good. Then you will be able to demonstrate the evil. Show the virtues to acquire. These virtues, of course, they will supersede the defects. They will counter the defects but they are more stronger. They bring us much further. If you want to have a final demonstration about this, about the commandments, what is the highest commandment? It's our Lord himself. It's God himself who tells us. Commandment, once again, is do this, don't do that, and so on. So what is the highest of them? It is the commandment of love, of charity. And this commandment is summarizing, is a sum up of all commandments. So you find everything in this commandment of loving, loving God with all our heart, all our being, all our soul, we have to put everything in it. And you can see how positive this is. Well, it is so positive and it is so aimed at God that this commandment does not have an end. It is a commandment to perfection but in such a way that we can never say, I love enough. Never. Because the one we must love is God. Infinite goodness. And the more we love, so to say, the more we understand that we must love more. That we must give more of ourselves. You see, speak of renouncement. If I say, like our Lord, renounce yourself, give up, take up your cross, well, it shows something heavy, a big burden. And our Lord does not stay there. He says, follow me. You've done that, follow me. And he goes to the cross. And we hear the Holy Scripture tell us he left us an example to follow, that we follow him. And he gives us what he does on the cross. He gives himself out of love and to love. There is no greater charity than to give his life for the one we love. 
and so that the world may know that I love the Father following his commandment as he wants, as he expects from me, so I do. These are his last words in the cenacle before going to his passion. That the world may know that I love the Father. The cross is the greatest proof of the love of the Son for the Father. And in this love, he gives everything. When you give out of love, you don't count. You don't look at yourself. You don't consider it's heavy. No, you forget about it. You just look at the one you love. It's so true. Look at the love of a mom for her children. This little kid in the middle of the night, he's weeping, he's crying, shouting out. Does the mom say, now you stop? Well, you can try, it didn't work. No, but that's what she says. She goes to the baby. She doesn't even think about, ah, once again. No, she just go. She cares. What's happening to him? Why is he weeping? She looks. You have this expression of love. Love does not count. You no longer look at the negative side. You're just full, full from this look into the one you love. If we can see this, even in, in human love at the best, how much more, how much more are we expected to do and to give to God? If you can bring to the souls the conviction of the importance of the first place of God in their life, if you can really get, it's a grace from God, do your part. Out of conviction, they will move. You see, it's something very interesting, which we see, especially in our modern times. Where you have virtue, you hardly need police, force. A country which needs to show the force, who needs to impress the people, who needs to threaten them by the presence of military, of police it, at every quarter. That means there is very, very little virtue. And so the only way to maintain the duly order is to threaten with this presence of the force. In this country where you have a little bit more of virtue, you hardly see a policeman. You don't need, because the people work by themselves. They care for the order by themselves. They want to. It's a very deep psychological truth. You want to see how much peace and order is in a country? Look how many policemen you can see. Very easy, very simple. Well, in our modern times, you see policemen everywhere. Simple. Which means there is a lot of lack of virtue. In fact, it does correspond to the modern thinking. Let everybody be free and whatever they want. Well, that's not virtue. And how, then, will you expect these people to respect the freedom of the others? That would be virtue. There's no virtue. So, you must show force everywhere. That's not what we want.
That's not what the church wants. But once again, to get to this virtue, to push, to help, to educate the people to virtue, first show the end, show the goodness of God. Show that it is worth looking at God through the faith, without even seeing everything, just out of faith, so to say blindly. Well, we have enough. God has given enough elements to help this faith. But bring them there. The rest follows. You will have to indicate, of course, you will have to speak about morals too. But first and above all, preach the doctrine. Preach the faith. All the rest comes by itself. Preach that we are here on earth, as it is said, as it is shown in all these Gospels, it's just for a little while. What is the comparison with the time on earth compared to eternity? It's nothing. St. Teresa of Avila said, well, life here on earth is like a bad night in a bad motel. That's it. Then it's day, then it's heaven. Once again, following, following this example of our Lord, who wants us, who wants us already now to aim at him, to have this desire of heaven. We have been created for that. Let us, let us really nourish now this time until the ascension, this desire to be united with him. I finished with this little story, which is very uh, curious, but which shows how we think. It was little flower, Saint Teresa, who said to her mother, Oh, mother, how much I desire that you die. Poor mothers were looking, what? Yeah, she wished her mother heaven. And to go to heaven, you must die. So the desire was not death. The desire was heaven. But look at ourselves, how we react in front of this phrase. Let's see how strong is our faith moving us. Do we raise enough our hearts to heaven? Amen. Name the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen.